So very good to have you both on the on the on the set. Looking forward to this very much. And in the in the audience, welcome very much to Conversations. We have uh, two guests on this program that are dear friends of mine. I want to introduce them and have a brief uh, discussion about the subject matter, which is going to be largely around the explo uh, the life and uh, adventures of a very interesting person, Reed Stowe. And he's joined by a friend of ours, uh, Carter Emmart. And Carter Emmart's the director of astrovisualization at the Rose Planetarium here in New York City. And they've been friends for a long time. And we're here to, to uh, talk with Reed. And gentlemen, welcome very, very much, Carter. Reed, welcome very much to Conversations. I wonder, Reed, maybe you could. We want to do a kind of uh, talk introduction to your life. Let me just say, you are a sailor man. You're an adventurer. You've done wondrous uh, works in that, and not the least of which was setting the sea, the uh, Mars Sea Odyssey of sailing over 1,000 days on the oceans of the world without any contact with land or resupply to set a world record. And that's one of the major things we're going to want to uh, relate to here in this overall series, uh, this overall program. But could you, just a little way, thumbnail way, uh, talk about your, 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 your adventures in the world of the ocean, on the oceans of the world. Well, uh, I did an expedition to Antarctica uh, well over 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I finished that, I uh, read about space psychology and uh, humans going in, uh, out into outer space. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I feel like I'm on a spaceship already the stars above and the stars reflecting in the water and just going on and on in this liquid environment. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the things I've learned at sea will be helpful for humans going into space. Very good. And that was when I got the concept mm -hmm. um, to call my voyaging space analogous voyaging at sea. That's interesting. That's a very interesting term. It was our Buckminster Fuller, our comprehensive philosopher, uh, spoke to the, us about the Earth as a spaceship. We right. need an operating manual for Spaceship Earth. But that's right. really very interesting. And you and Car Carter have known each other for some time. Maybe you could add a little yourself, Carter, to your own background and when you met Reed. Well, I became aware of Reed uh, in the late 80s mm -hmm. um, when a friend of ours, uh, a journalist, uh, Leonard David, picked us up. Um, Leonard uh, uh, had been uh, a friend of a group of us. Uh, um, as students at the University of Colorado had held a conference called The Case for Mars, making the case for human missions to Mars, mm -hmm. um, which uh, the planning had uh, long since uh, become bankrupt for that, uh, really within the Nixon administration was mm -hmm. the last time it had been looked at uh, in the early 80s when mm -hmm. we held this Mars meeting. And it turned into a series of Mars meetings, and uh, around uh, the late 80s, um, Leonard told me I should talk to a fellow New Yorker, uh, Reed Stowe, and, and we got together uh, and worked on an article um, together. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, my artwork appeared on the cover of the magazine from the National Space Society mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the uh, lead article being uh, essentially uh, Reed's journey um, uh, that uh, he was proposing to do. Yeah, yeah His, that's uh, that was about 25 years ago. Yeah, they're 25 years. You've known each other a long time. Both visionaries in a very real sense. I congratulate you both on your life's work and so forth. And we're going to be showing uh, on the screen behind us. We're going to be showing a kind of uh, uh, slideshow that that Carter's pr uh, controlling from his computer. We're going to be showing that momentarily. But we just wanted to sort of set it up here in a, in, a, in an introductory way. Reed is somebody who did sail out into the oceans of the world in uh, 2007, I think, from mm -hmm. Hoboken, on the idea of sailing for 1,000 days without resupply and setting a world record in that regard. He pa surpassed that record by sailing, I think it was 1,252 days. 152. 1,152. 1,152 days when he sailed up the Hudson River back to uh, having d accomplished that, a monumental feat, and that's something that should be celebrated by one and all. I congratulate you on such a, an enormous accomplishment comparable to Lindy going across the Atlantic, something on that order, and he ought to be recognized in those terms. It would seem to me, and it seems to a number of other people, and I congratulate you very much on that. 
So I think maybe what we were thinking of, and uh, we wanted to have some uh, t uh, to this, Carter has on his computer a, a what we call a slideshow or a number of images that we're going to show maybe over the next 35, 40 minutes or so. And we're going to be uh, showing those. We have one in the background now. We're going to be dimming the house lights and showing that. So maybe we could start with that. Are you ready to go I, with your show, Carter? I am, and I, I think we really kind of start off with understanding. Okay, maybe if we could so dim the house lights really right down, please, it might bring the image up a little more <laughs> clearly. And then we'll be talking to these images. And uh, could you get the camera on the image, the Keystone camera? Uh, it'll just take a second to get it focused on the image. It's not there yet, but it will be. And then we'll be talking to the, uh, to the slideshow as uh, it's being uh, presented. This, we can talk to it, but we can see it on the screen. There we go, we've got it on the screen now. So okay. maybe you can talk to this, Carter, right. what well, this is. Carter, or, and or, we'll all pop well, up for you two primarily. I just wanna say that, that uh, the, the show sort of starts in a little bit after Reed began uh, his story, and so I read your, your, uh, your first voyages and, and so forth, and meeting Montessier, and, actually leading to this. Oh yeah, you right. can talk to that, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I built my first boat when I was 20 years old. My, my family, my father had built boats when I was a child, mm -hmm. and I built a boat at our family's beach cottage in North Carolina, and here you see us getting ready to sail out and sail across the North Atlantic, but my family's on board, my grandmother and aunt and brothers and cousins, and, and it was a family project mm -hmm. that made all of my sailing possible. Yes. This I've met your family, wonderful people. Well, yeah. we thank you for hosting uh, our return party. At, well, you come from house. good stock, young man. That's it's, what I, was uh, uh, I say family love is very important. That gave me the power to look out into the world and say I could do anything. Absolutely. So yeah. that supported me throughout mm -hmm. my life. Mm -hmm. What year was this? Uh, this this is. Uh, 1973, mm. when I'm uh, uh, getting ready to sail out uh, and sail across the North Atlantic in this little catamaran that's uh, 26 feet long, but it weighed 1,400 pounds, so that makes it uh, lighter than an outboard motor. Wow. And it's a, it w uh, we had no motor, no mm. radio, no electricity, no life raft, uh, um, no electronics and it was very primitive sailing. But we chose the right seasons. We sailed across the North Atlantic in the middle of the summer, and I left Europe before the fall, mm -hmm. and I timed my voyages to sail with the wind and currents in the best seasons. This wasn't the first time you had sailed in the ocean, right? Uh, no, I, I had sailed for a year in the South Pacific as a teenager with another teenager. Mm -hmm. And actually, the person who sailed with me on the uh, catamaran, Ivo van Lock, was a Dutchman. He was 24, I was 21. Mm -hmm. He knew more about sailing th than I did. He had his old brass World War I sextant, mm -hmm. and that's what we used to navigate. Mm -hmm. And it was thanks really to Ivo arriving in North Carolina who said, let's take it across the North Atlantic because I wasn't planning on doing it. It's very, very, uh, uh, I, I would be uh, loath to do such without a life raft. Well, was that brave or was that fool? Well, a lot of boats uh, have never had life rafts in the past. You see, really? like in the yeah. early 70s, the, the sailors that were sailing around the world then were sailing in small boats, and, and most of them didn't have life rafts. I guess you're right. So yeah. even the years before that didn't have life rafts or electronics to call for help, no radio to call for help. The sailors that were sailing right. back then were sailing like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. We so, should, yeah. Uh, they the, were brave men, all, and we should celebrate that. And, Thank you for and that And they lesson. were skilled yeah. sailors. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so the boat uh, is a safe boat if you sail it in the right place at the right time. Without some perfect storm. Right. Mm, without, a, yeah. without a major storm. Yeah. But it's, mm. a catamaran is unsinkable because there's no weight in it. Uh -huh. So we figured that it oh, would that never would sink. Be, uh -huh. And we did have a rowboat on board. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes. Well, that'd be yeah. like a dinghy. So yeah. that would be like a dinghy that anyway, we, could, we yeah. could get into. I didn't mean to go off on that, but anyway, your whole life is too darn interesting, Carter. You know, we could spend a whole life on, you know, the South Seas adventures when you were 18, but we got to keep going, yeah? And, we're, and here, I, here we are sailing along, 
this is one of the few moments that I'm actually holding the tiller of the boat mm -hmm. because we had uh, self-steering devices on the back of the boat which always guided the boat. Mm -hmm. But at this particular time, we were in very rough weather mm -hmm. and a wave swept away one of the two self-steering vanes on the boat. Mm -hmm. So we took the other one off so, that, so we wouldn't risk losing it and being swept away. And for a very short period of time, uh, mm -hmm. we steered the boat. But the rest of the time, the years that I sailed the boat, mm -hmm. uh, it had a self-steering gear, and I never actually guided the boat by uh, hand. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, when we finished that voyage, uh, the family was all excited and, and supportive to, um, uh, to help us build a bigger boat, mm -hmm. a schooner. And this is our family beach cottage in North Carolina that my granddad and dad and uncles built and we were children and we grew up here mm -hmm. and and now my brother and I are together here in front of the house. Is that Wave? Our, that's Wave. Mm -hmm. Our other brother took mm -hmm. the picture so there's a third brother who helped build the boat. Okay. So uh. it was three brothers in the family who helped mm -hmm. build the schooner mm -hmm. and we had our big garden in the backyard so mm -hmm. it was a, it was a very uh, organic process. Did you cut timbers for that right from the forest? We, it was lovingly went, built. Yes, that yes. was a very important message mm. that uh, uh, even back then I knew the importance of building the boat with love that that would empower the boat. Yeah. That means everything you do, you do with love yeah. and that puts a certain magic into the boat. Okay. And the boat was built with love because it was never anyone we paid to build help us. Boy. It was all people who came with love to put their love in the boat. What a lesson. So, for the, that's more of a lesson for the human condition you may realize. Yeah, that's a that's uh, an important one. As Very things important. get transpired. Go ahead. Now yeah. the last picture showed the uh, the 16 by 16 foot plywood floor, and here we drew out the design of the boat. So if you look right in the middle, you'll see a sort of more of a, a B shape, a triangular shape. That's up towards the bow of the boat, and as you go backwards. The, the lines show that the boat gets volume and belly, and it's a displacement boat. It's a cargo boat. It's an old-fashioned design from the, uh, um, the turn of the 20th century. Had it's you taken, not a racing boat. Had you taken it's, it from a particular design that you had found in the it's archives? It's basically or an, an American fishing schooner okay. design, mm -hmm. and there were that was the, the most used and popular boat in America for, for a couple of hundred years. So Wonderful. that design was refined by the craftsmen sailors over a couple of hundred years. Mm -hmm. And we're welding up the frames in this picture. I see. You welding just... up the steel frames. Mm -hmm. The boat is built of steel and fiberglass. Mm -hmm. Now here we are on the ground preparing the steel frames to hang them up. Behind us is the shed and inside of that shed we hung up the steel frames and we lined them up. Then, now that's the view from the front. Right. And we're putting up the last triangular shape on the front of the bow of the boat. Mm -hmm. So then the steel bars wrap around those frames and give the boat the shape. And here the bottom of the frames, the three brothers are pushing the steel up and welding the steel on the bottom of the frames that gives us our keel. Uh huh. And it Had was, you ever built a major boat like that before? Well, I built the catamaran. A, yeah. And before yeah. that. Okay. That but was, I had never built this boat. Went up uh, from 1,400 pounds to uh, say 110,000 pounds. But you were autodidactic. You were teaching yourself. You didn't go to a, uh, a school of shipbuilding no, and take a degree I, and get I, a certificate. I learned by looking. I went to a doing. lot of different boat yards. Yeah, uh -huh. I worked in some boat yards building boats. And you and educate, I went, I educated up, yourself with love of what you were doing. I always mm -hmm. looked and, and, and asked and learned questions uh, and was very, very focused about what I did. Very good. A very good model for all, I would say. I had, w I had a fanatic uh, passion to build my own boats and go to sea. You had a vision and you had a purpose that was very pointed, and I think that's a good lesson for a lot of people. And you know, Anyway, yeah. congratulations. It goes back so far, I can just I say guess. that I'm I lucky. Know. Yeah, yeah. That I'm lucky that you saw the bow of the boat in mm -hmm. the other picture, mm -hmm. where all the steel frames come together in the, uh, at the very stem of the boat, and now the stern of the boat. You see, we shaped the boat a lot by eye, by bending steel to see what the steel could do, uh -huh. and we got on our neighbor's roof and looked at the boat from beside 
and this is the stern of the boat and the steel wraps and gives the stern what we call the global stern it's sort of a very round stern and it's narrow uh -huh. so that when you're running downwind in a big storm and the waves are breaking if you have a wide box like stern on the boat which a lot of boats have it's not easy to bend wood to that kind of shape I guess. so if you have a wide box like stern and you're running downwind the windage can cause the boat to veer, uh -huh. but if the waves slam the stern of, stern of the boat, that's very dangerous. Yeah. It can cause the boat to spin sideways. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's another shot of the stern of the boat, and now the steel is coming in and giving it shape. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we, we needed a uh, rowboat, a sailboat, uh, uh, ship's boats that would, would row and sail and be unsinkable because uh -huh. we didn't have a life raft. Okay. We counted on those boats not sinking and being able to uh, row uh, the boat or sail the boat. And, and it, all, it had emergency supplies in it, uh -huh. water, medical stuff, right. flares, and, and okay. so forth. I'm glad to so hear that. So two of these boats were yeah. our lifeboat. We okay. built them. Okay. And we're sailing, testing them and taking them out sailing. And in the background is the boat right up on the, the shore. Yeah. On how, the, long, how long did it take you to build the boat? It took From us the beginning to the end. A, a year and a half year and a half. We okay. started building it and we launched it. But the whole interior of the boat mm -hmm. was was uh, uh, empty. We sailed away with the interior empty, but with a full cargo. Uh -huh. With the plan of getting tropical hardwood in South America and the Caribbean to build the interior of the boat. And no that's what kidding. we did. Wow, wow. So in this picture, uh, we sold the catamaran and now it looks like you know, four of us uh -huh. are pushing this tiny little boat yeah. backwards into the water yeah. and that's uh, goodbye to the little catamaran Tantra. Oh, right. And there she is in the water with, with the big schooner in the background. That was a good ship, huh? Uh, she was a wonderful boat. It's a warham designed catamaran and uh, I recommend them as, as great seaworthy boats. About the cheapest, most simple boat you mm -hmm. could live on. And they're very good boats. Any any redolence of uh, 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 people from the on the Pacific? They had catamaran early. Uh, yeah, that's a Polynesian coming, style uh, catamaran. It has the look of a primitive Polynesian style. Polynesian, catamaran. that was yeah. the term. I it's yeah. not a racing catamaran. No, right. It wasn't a fast catamaran. Yeah, yeah. So it could carry the gear and supplies we need, and it's it was a safe design. Contiki was a raft, right? Contiki was a balsa raft, just yeah. drifting. It yeah, could only okay. drift. It okay. wasn't a sailboat. They okay. could put up a sail to help yeah. it drift faster. What is that log? Now, that's one of the trees that we picked out in the forest near where we bu built the boat. And uh, we chopped the tree down, and we uh, cleaned the bark off of it. Looks and like it, a mast. It, 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 it's not yet a mast. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we we've got it on a split bed trailer and towed it to the boat yard mm. so here we are in the, in the boat yard uh with the boat next to us with the uh this this little trailer that that pulled the log there and we're going to roll it off next to the boat and then we're going to here we are shaping our trees into masts and spars wow okay <laughs> wonderful wonderful yeah Lovingly, yes. And then mm -hmm. the thing about a boat like this is uh, it, um, it's a lot of uh, labor, but a lot of it's quite easy for people to do. And if people come and they want to help with things, uh, um, women and inexperienced people could help. Mm -hmm. And um, the, a big, big part of the labor that went into this boat was done by teenagers okay. and people that were only 20 years old. Inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's the stern tube going out of the back of the uh, boat. That stern tube uh, goes, uh, supports the uh, propeller. Mm -hmm. from, from the motor, the propeller, uh, the, the shaft to the propeller. Okay. And there's, there's bearings in that tube that support the shaft spinning. Uh -huh. And we're working on, on, the, on the boat, putting on the steel mesh. Now, we could have built a ferro-cement boat that's the design method we were following. But instead of using cement, we used fiberglass putty. So we, we put the steel bars up, we covered the boat with uh, cross-welded galvanized mesh inside mm -hmm. and out. And we made it so smooth you could rub your hands on it. And uh -huh. it was perfect, in the perfect shape of the boat. Okay. Then we plastered it with fiberglass putty. Now here we are getting ready to get to work. There's a gang of us. Everybody has scarves on because if you're under the boat, 
and, and you're plastering, sometimes the fiberglass putty is, is dripping on your head. Mm. But we, we mix the fiberglass uh, um, resin up with a product called Ferrolite, which is sort of like chop mat micro balloons, and that gave us a putty that was looked like cement, uh -huh. and it, we puttied the, uh, the steel and mesh of the boat uh -huh. with that. Uh, and it's it, here we are squeezing the putty in, into the steel mesh frames of the boat, and at this point, it'll be dry in a few hours, mm -hmm. and then you can see if you can damage it with an axe or a sledgehammer. Really? You can't. A, a, a sledgehammer will bounce off, and an axe will will chip when it hits the steel in the fiberglass. Wow. So it's quite a strong method of building a boat. And now, after thirty. Uh, four years in the water, mm -hmm. um, it's proven to be a very good m material, very strong, and very cheap to repair. And, and you not have adequately, you very appropriately named it Anne after your lovely uh, mother, yes, who I've met, uh -huh. and uh, she, that's a good namesake, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good that, for you. That was, uh, the boat is named Anne after mom. What do we got here now, Reed? Well, you can it's see really the shape of the boat. We've plastered the boat with, with fiberglass putty. It's about an inch and a quarter thick. And then we took turns with the belt sanders and ground, grinders and grind, ground it down and putted it a little more and tried to make it as, as smooth as we could. It's not as smooth as a, as a yacht that comes out of a mold. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's very, very seaworthy. The design of the boat uh, makes it seaworthy. It's a strong boat, uh, but the design of the boat, boat itself makes it very seaworthy. Are there it's, weak boats? Oh, well, modern racing boats compromise strength for speed. Okay, So right. they're breaking down quite a lot. Okay, there's a lesson and, in there. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's the way it is with a lot of boats. Uh, like the, all the dinner cruise boats that are on the river mm -hmm. should not go out in the ocean. They're not built for the stress right. that the ocean sea can going. cause a yeah. boat. Right. They're too square. Mm -hmm. This boat is long like a cigar with, mm -hmm. a, with a 10 foot deep keel that mm -hmm. holds the boat upright mm -hmm. when the wind is in the sails. Mm -hmm. And we varnished our, uh, our blocks, our pulleys and our steering wheels and uh, up on the front porch of the house. And so we had work going on on the boat and and back at the house all at the same time. <laughs> and here it's we are beautiful. dropping our, our motor in. It's a Det Detroit diesel, 140 horsepower. We have a, a hatch in the roof of the pilot house, mm -hmm. and, a, and the floor in the pilot house lifts out of the way, mm -hmm. and it drops right down onto the steel engine beds that are lined up with the propeller shaft that we showed in the earlier picture. The same crane picked our masts up off the uh, uh, ground next to the boat and, uh, and held them from the top and lowered the mast down through the holes in the deck to land in, in, the, in a fixture uh, uh, eight feet below the deck. Mm -hmm. uh, then we could use wedges and straighten out the mast just like we liked and yeah. give it the right angle that we want. I see. Oh. 70 foot stem to stern, right? Yes, mm -hmm. on deck. But with the bowsprit goes another 15 feet out in front of the boat, mm -hmm. and that keeps the boat balanced. And we decided to do as much as we could finishing the boat and getting her ready to sail while she was uh, out of the water, because we knew once we put her in the water, we wouldn't have a place to keep her. Mm -hmm. And we had our family beach cottage and a, and a guest house mm -hmm. where we could stay with our crew and friends and relatives and helpers. So we knew that once we put her in the water, we would ha try to have her as finished as possible, uh, and, it, and then it was time to take her sailing. Mm -hmm. We weren't going to hang around. We were going to put her in the water and, and, and take her across the ocean. That's Big the same day thing I did with the, that. Uh, when did you launch? Could you remember the day? It was 1978 uh, 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 in, in the spring. In the spring. You don't have right. the exact date? I can't There was no remember. bottle of champagne to well, break Well, we broke a bottle. bottle of champagne oh, good on for the you. bow yeah. of the boat. To keep with tradition, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. And this is, this is then the first day that we were out sailing. Oh, boy, that's a vintage. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And she sailed just fine. 
if she did sailed, you have any did you have any thoughts boy this thing's going to not work or anything when you went down no, or were you in fact, confident no no i never had doubts in fact uh, i'm not a very good engineer i've gotten better over the you years you seem to be pretty good nautical uh, uh, engineer to me young man i, I mean uh, i should say uh, diesel mechanic oh. because we we were on the dock with all of our family and friends there mm -hmm. and we couldn't start the motor <laughs> so i said we're going sailing anyway uh -huh. yeah. so we this pushed off the ship. dock on the yeah. very first time we ever tried to sailor right we pushed off the dock uh -huh. and and got out the river and the the current in the river started taking us down, down and we set our sails yeah. yes uh -huh. we set our sails and, and it sailed worked. and it sailed and we away. sailed out into the ocean that must have been and we turned around and sailed back and anchored near the dock and then pulled a road a line over and then pulled the boat over do you still have that firmly locked in your memory bank that day and the wonder of that day of pulling that off i must have been something that you know resonated. i wasn't someone who was shy about it i could have said the motor doesn't start we're not going but i said no we're, we're all ready to go we're going to go anyway without the motor i don't i had done all of my sailing before that yeah. for three years yeah. to four continents and yeah. up the Amazon River with no motor. Yeah, I don't so think, I said, we're going to sail anyway without a motor. I don't think shy applies to Reed Stowe particularly. Although you're very, very uh, spiritually grounded, which I think is worth mentioning. You're very spiritually, and you named your catamaran Tantra. You're very interesting. You're very spiritual in mm -hmm. your consciousness. Yeah, the, I've always uh, ma done my voyages with spiritual themes mm -hmm. to learn about the, the, the deeper nature of man. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Now, here's my crew uh, mm. um, uh, that we went to the Antarctic with. Wow. There was uh, six guys and two women, uh, five nationalities, and we spent about four to five months all together. Wow. And that was where I started to say, well, that's almost like going into space with a crew. So how are we dealing with crew relations, the mm -hmm. psychology of crew? Yeah. How do you keep them getting along together, mm -hmm. performing together? Absolutely. And then, uh, how, for instance, how do you deal with someone when they get upset? How do you deal with two people who are fighting? Mm -hmm. How do you resolve issues and get the crew back together again, functioning as they should? Mm -hmm. These are things I learned uh, being captain of the boat, mm -hmm. and these are things that I think are relevant to a, a crew who will go into space. For, we were only four months on that voyage. On a that crew voyage. who will go into space for an extended period of time, four months, a year, or more. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what I learned on the Antarctic you expedition. Actually, you actually sailed in Antarctic waters, which are treacherous, or can be treacherous. Well, we huh? sailed down in, into the ice as, as far as you can possibly go. Uh -huh. And yes, it is about the most dangerous, uh, far away sailing you can do in the world. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you were testing that then, and then you, you came mm -hmm. back, and then you had this idea about the uh, trip to Mars and the, uh, the analog to the question right. of mankind possibly visiting outer space, maybe Mars, as, a, yeah. as a, uh, a way of learning the psychological and other issues that would be involved at a human level for such a venture. You'll have to put a group of people together in a very small, right. cramped That's space. Right. That's right. And they'll have to learn how to get along together for years. Mm -hmm. that in a life and death environment. And that's yes, something okay. we don't really know about in the human experience. Yeah, that's right. We don't know how people can relate and get along together and perform when they're cramped together in, in an environment where from the, uh, from the moment they go, they have to accept the fact we're in a dangerous situation and we could die. So I accept that. And now my psychology is a little bit different than it is when I'm living normally on the earth yeah. because you accept that you're going to get taken care of and go to the hospital real quick and that you're not actually in a life and death environment. But when you're isolated on a boat at sea or isolated on a spaceship, you have to come to terms with your mortality and accept it in order to have a healthy experience while yeah. you're out there. You mentioned those seamen of old who went out and you made the analogy to them in terms of uh, their being in a very desperate, you know, a situation. So there was something that might be led from the lore of the people who sailed long ways on the Earth's surface, uh, you know, on, yeah, on the I oceans. But you've set a record for an individual particularly also, if I may, with your Mars Sea Odyssey. And I, I know we want to get mm -hmm. to that and make the analogy between the Mars uh, vo voyage uh, that is coming up, and uh, oh, there's a sea turtle. Now. Okay. That well, this this is real interesting because w during the period of time that I was preparing to uh, 
to do the thousand day sea voyage, yes. I made a lot of test sails okay. and I went longer and longer at sea. Mm -hmm. Now this, this uh, is a map and you can see South America and Africa in the map. And I looked at the winds and currents and I said, well, we're going to go out there. We don't have what we need to go a thousand days at sea. We're not ready. Uh, we don't have the food, we don't have the electronic equipment, we don't have the supplies, we have old sails, but we got to go sailing. We're going to go anyway and we're going to go out for 200 days, which is unprecedented oh. um, for a, a man and a woman to say we're going to take a boat out for that long. Yes, it's, indeed. It's, it hadn't indeed. been done. That's, yeah, so that was a, a test year, yeah. voyage for us and we chose to draw the shape of a sea turtle in the South Atlantic Ocean uh -huh. as a reminder uh, uh, to the world of the ancient wisdom of Aesop's fable, the turtle and the hare, okay. to go slowly but surely yeah. instead of fast and brash. Uh, so that was a sort of a conceptual artistic voyage that we took as a shakedown test voyage for the thousand day voyage. And that sea. was 200 days? That was 200 days. Wow, you got that successfully done mostly in the Atlantic? Uh, that was oh. all in the Atlantic. All in the Atlantic. It was oh. right there. The turtle was done in in the South Atlantic. Do you have knowledge of the storm patterns and the difficulties and when it's best to be at a particular part of the world's oceans and another from climatological records and that sort of thing? And do you pay attention to that? Or how do you decide yeah. where on all the oceans of the world you're going to spend your time when you're on such a thing as a thousand days at sea? Well, uh, you could go anywhere I, in the world. When you, as soon as you uh, get ready to take uh, a sailboat to sea, mm -hmm. that has to be in, in your basic seamanship knowledge mm -hmm. is what the winds and currents and weather's doing yes. wherever you're going to go. Mm -hmm. And there are pilot charts that have been made over the years. This was very important for sailors of the past because yes. there's wind and currents that you have to use to go where you want to go. Yes. And there's big hurricane seasons all over the world. And uh, if possible, you don't want to be in those places during the hurricane season months. Decidedly. So what I did was I looked at the, I, I studied the hurricane seasons over the whole world mm -hmm. and I drew the areas, uh, circles around the areas where they were and I said I'm not going in to this part of the Atlantic and it's a very big area we have from image. the month of, of July until the end of October so We're, I wasn't going to go in, into those areas. We have an image now uh, that uh, Carter's projected out. And maybe you could talk to this, Carter. What is it you're showing us now? Well, because this is an image of the world. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, but uh, also in scale here yeah. is, the, uh, is, is Reed's schooner. Yes. Uh, actually, to the, uh, to the International Space Station mm -hmm. as, as a size comparison. Uh -huh. um, typically, we, we see images of the, uh, of the International Space Station, um, and we have the shuttle uh, the docks, uh, the, 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 if you can see the cursor here, I guess we do, this is a shuttle would dock here. Um, but uh, this gives you a sense of the uh, scale of the space station yeah. from the, the standpoint of uh, putting Reed's boat next to it. Yeah. But uh, in, in so doing, uh, one gains uh, a sort of appreciation of, uh, of the scales of the, um, of the living quarters. Yes. Uh, if, if we, I have to pan around a little bit here, but... Uh, uh, bear with me, is that we can see the scale of the boat, uh, Reed's crew of six going down to Antarctica, uh, and these being uh, the uh, modules on the uh, space station. That's a beautiful image. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that, That's the space right. station rendered. Uh -huh. Is this uh, something okay. of yours, or is this something? And then the earth behind is absolutely gorgeous, isn't it, Reed? It's, it's a great uh, shot. It's mm. a three-dimensional three model mm -hmm. of the schooner mm -hmm. that, uh, that Carter is able to fly through space and look at the, the schooner from any angle and uh, uh, take it anywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. But here he's got it next to the space station to make a, a comparison uh, of these two ships. Yes, and, I think it's wonderful. And, uh, and sort of get your mind out into space with the boat to to uh, make the connection that there is similarities with uh, being on a on a it, boat and a and a spaceship. Right, and Carter, I congratulate you on that. Uh, the uh, did you render this or how was it done? It might be just worth a couple of minutes of well, rendering uh, such images. Not only this, but also uh, just a quick word 
about how important uh, the work of the planetarium people that are doing things in terms of uh, visual display. Well, as as a as just it's a, an art form. Yes, uh, what what we do at the American Museum of Natural History uh, when we rebuilt the uh, uh, planetarium, uh, the uh, old Hayden Planetarium. Here we see a bit of uh, data loss down at the uh, South Pole of Antarctica, but uh, uh, let me just uh, center the globe for us for a second, is that um, we made a decision in going from projecting just the stars or a view of the sky to really the ability to project um, space and yeah. to be able to uh, make an atlas that we call the digital uh, universe atlas, actually. Uh, it's at the HaydenPlanetarium.org website. Uh, you can download the uh, atlas for free. Mm -hmm. Is that um, uh, it essentially uh, takes you um, from our location in space uh, around the sun mm -hmm. on out into uh, the depths of space. So if I was to pull away from the solar system there, the sun, uh, pull out the stars and all this are in accurate three-dimensional positions. So that's what we're seeing around us just briefly here. Amazing. And if I pull out of the uh, Milky Way and so on. Now, of course, uh, this is the basis by which we do our, uh, our space shows at the... Um, uh, at, at the uh, Hayden Planetarium, which is now part, it's 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 inside the Rose yeah. Center for Earth and Space at uh -huh. the American Museum. Right, right. Um, and so we do our, our space shows um, based on this, um, and these are galaxy positions, uh, for yeah. example. So the atlas goes across sort of all scales from, Congratulations from Earth, on macro that. scale. But we can also, um, uh, we when we're presenting this, we can present it live as I'm doing now, just navigating with my mouse here. Um, surveys of galaxies incomplete because they haven't measured the entire sky. Um, that's that's why they're butterfly wings of galaxies going on. But um, that in our live presentations, uh, in order to sort of keep on keep tabs with Reed, um, that uh, we uh, Reed's support crew here in New York mm -hmm. uh, put together the means to take his uh, Met Ocean unit. Uh, positions, his GPS locations that were beamed back by satellite telephone technology, um, and plot that in uh, for Google Earth, but uh, that we could also read it at the planetarium. Track them. Uh, yeah, so track that we could track uh, mm -hmm. Reed's course uh, for the thousand day journey when he did this. Mm -hmm. And um, I will just uh, show that to us a little better by turning off the uh, clouds on the Earth. And um, that uh, what, we're, what we're left with here quickly uh, as I come up, I'll also turn off the uh, International Space Station for the moment. Um, I need to center us on Earth for a second. Isn't it amazing, Reed, these yeah. graphics that they've got coming up now? It, it's it just mind-boggling. Uh, amazing, and mo I think most people haven't seen anything like this no. unless they've been to the planetarium. Well, but, no, um, and the, the planetariums are the future of visualization of images yeah. beyond the television and so forth. And in yeah. addition to this, we use this in the live programming. In fact, you see a bunch of post-it-looking squares here. Those are positions, as Reed finished the journey, of uh, various uh, ship locations. Um, they're kind of blotting out the screen from what I can see, but here we can see the dates and so on. We would actually communicate with Reed. Reed yes. would call us up on he had the satellite phone. telephone, didn't he? And yeah. so we yeah. could show mm. where he was on mm -hmm. the globe during our live presentations mm -hmm. and have a communication uh, with him. And um, so if, if you allow me, I'll just come in close. There's so many other vessels around, but uh, we Oh, wanted, those are all vessels? Is uh, that we it? We wanted to see, ve yes, we wanted to plot vessel locations around Reed uh -huh. um, just so that, uh, uh, it, so that we had, a, uh, we had a, a look at basically what the crowding was for any particular time. This uh -huh. is also a snapshot of when the, when the journey was finished. And so if I come in... That's the day he came closer. up the Hudson River? I'll never forget it's it. It's the day before. He day sailed 11, by with a big, broad grin as he came up to Pier 61 or whatever it was. It was wonderful, yeah. So, Welcome back. Uh. Yeah. But um, so that the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the entire journey is, is mapped out here, but uh, we also have slides of that journey um, that uh, perhaps we can talk about, but uh, um, if I do come in just a little closer again, we can see on the outbound leg, uh, perhaps uh, as, as we move out, let me give us a view of the horizon and perhaps begin just moving forward. Here we can see 
uh, days five and six mm -hmm. a little bit becalmed. I remember you had to move your course because there was some bombing operations that the Navy was conducting. The Navy, like the Navy flew an airplane down and and they were swooping around us mm -hmm. and so I cut on my VHF radio mm -hmm. and they called me and uh, and they said you're entering a bombing range don't you know there's a bombing range out here? Ye gods. And I'm thinking, how am I supposed to know there's a bombing range right, out right. in the middle of the North Atlantic? Yeah, right. And so, well, we we turned around and went the other way for okay, for yeah. a couple of days. And you did because we didn't want to get bombed. Soon after you left, you had a a, a collision with a big ship, didn't you? We Some turned around and went back to to, say, to sea, and and two weeks out, we had a collision with a big ship, uh -huh. and we're lucky we're alive. we we were lucky that we were able to continue uh -huh. and we af we sailed on for over three years mm -hmm. with a damaged disabled boat they it couldn't was. sail the as well was knocked out. yeah right. okay you Here. were and the thing is that you sailed for three years uh, let's underscore that uh, no for you sailed for three years uh, uh, 1125 days out on the oceans of the world out of sight of land with no resupply is that correct? And you pulled it off. You had to yeah. collect rain. You had to get food. You had to have water. You had to do all of these things. Maybe those are a few things that people would be interested in, plus you were on your own a good part of the time. So maybe you could talk to that human dimension of what you went through. Reed, thank you. That's an absolutely incredible, uh, incredible thing, yeah. There's Sonia. It might be well worth mentioning Sonia. Absolutely. Your, I was about okay. to. Yeah, good for Sonia and Darcy. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we're about I, 40 minutes. I, I uh, um, planned this project, and for 20 years, I went around the world and I told everyone I was going to go a thousand days nonstop at sea. And let me tell you, I never found another guy who would go with me. No one said, no, people didn't believe it was possible. Yeah, but right. no one said, I'm ready to abandon life on the land and go into the unknown. And so I met Sonia, and we were friends for three years mm -hmm. before was, I was able to talk her into it, or, or she decided on her own and said, I'm ready South, to go with you. A family from South America originally, no? Uh, um, yeah. Guinea? Uh, uh, well, her family's from Guyana, Guyana but, but they're, right. they're Indian, uh -huh. from India. Right. And, and she was a photographer. She was a photographer. On, Very good uh, photographer. And that's how she found the boat on the waterfront. Uh-huh. And uh, so after three years of me trying to talk her into it, she decided she was ready to go. And then we lived together for a year before we left, uh -huh. preparing to go. Mm -hmm. This is the very first morning of the voyage. Uh, we you mean woke you, up, were, you were about to sail? We already uh, sailed overnight. Uh -huh. And the first morning, uh, we got together, we set the camera on a tripod, took a picture of the two of us, we loaded it into the computer, connected by a wire to the Iridium telephone yes. and sent it back to our That's website. Right. We so on the first day at sea, day one, mm -hmm. our friends posted on the website, here they are, and we said we're so grateful to be out and our voyage is beginning. Wonderful. That might be worth mentioning the website because it's still at 1000 1000days.net, dot dot 1000, dot dot net. Magnificent site that one and all can go to to become in more in tune with what this gentleman and uh, has achieved. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of people that worked on that site, and uh -huh. it, it has a lot there. You had some of the best people in your corner, not the least of which was this guy Carter Emmer. Well, there was a, a real good team of people who put a lot of work in the project for many years might and helped worth, share the project with the world. might be worth mentioning that you had tried to get, let's say, big uh, media support or big corporate support for your venture. I Maybe it could be worth mentioning, well, and what, it was difficult to come by, so you were on your entrepreneurial own in a certain sense, but that, that dynamic in terms of our society might be worth mentioning, and uh, why you weren't visit visited by the President of the United States when you returned. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, those are a, As you a, a, a lot been. of issues. Yeah. Um, uh, I tried to get sponsorship for 20 years, mm -hmm. and I thought after doing an Antarctic expedition that yes. I would be able to do it. But most of the sponsorship going to boats uh, goes to racing boats, mm -hmm. and it's put on by these clubs and so mm -hmm. forth. Europe, especially France, has sponsorship for boats. But basically, I was talking about doing something that no one had ever heard of. Yeah. No one uh, believed that I could do it. 
and also so it was difficult for uh, any kind of corporation or company to get behind me because if they did it could be embarrassing for them also if or, i may or, we were talking about this and when lindy did it he sailed off into across the ocean in an airplane he was greeted by the president because he was heralding an aerospace industry which a lot of people could see they were going to make a lot of money at right so it is that the only value that seems to have any resonancy in the immediate context of the world and so forth and values is money. And they couldn't see how your thing, which was also yours, was an individual doing something rather than some big bureaucracy. Maybe that right. affects why certain people in positions of responsibility weren't able to cotton on to what you were up to. But I think a lot of people could and should and probably will cotton on to your, your, your achievement as an individual of such incredible proportion. That's my suggestion. Well, I think it'll, it'll catch on eventually. Uh, and, and no achievement like this, if, even if it's done as an in individual, uh, as an individual, I reach an awareness of my connectivity to all of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's where I get the insight and the power to achieve what I achieve. Yeah. So to me, I wasn't an individual. To me, I was uh, very connected to humanity doing what I was doing. Humanity was feeding me to do it. And in turn, I felt myself feeding humanity. And you did, all, you did have a regular p a pattern, if I may, on the boat when you were alone uh, of uh, meditation, and, and art. You're also a very fine artist, not only painting, but also sculpture. Wood sculpture, a great deal, beautiful work. So you had uh, that as part of your makeup that helped, I would have thought. Well, it's very true. It does help. I made figureheads for my first boat. Mm -hmm. When I was 20 years old, I said, uh, we need figureheads. All the boats through history have had figureheads. Yes. Why do mm -hmm. they have figureheads? That's a big question because the sailors, because the cultures that sent those boats to sea believed that would help them. Yeah. Now, there must be some sense in that. And, yeah. and to me, there is. I see it. Um, my, I believe my figureheads helped me achieve what I did. Uh -huh. I also painted in the same way I believe my paintings helped me do what mm -hmm. I do. So I can explain that, is but that, that goes on into detail. Is that wave? Okay, you... well, there, there, this picture is picture's interesting. This is the morning after we were hit by the ship. Oh, it is you. And okay, the sorry. and the uh, the bowsprit is busted back. It's 15 uh -uh. feet long. It's busted back. The pulpit that keeps me from falling off the bowsprit when I do the sails yeah. was busted off. Wow. And the sail is still up. Mm -hmm. And I have crawled out there so that I can start untangling the mess of steel wires. I had to crawl out with a grinder that would cut steel wow. and start cutting things away. And See the uh, yeah. and then yeah. uh, I was able to get yeah. the, the tangle undone. But to the left of that picture, you can see the figurehead. We yes, were just right. speaking yeah, about them. Show, yeah. The figurehead hit the ship first. Wow, really? And broke on the bottom. It was a big ship that you ran into. Yeah, it was a very big ship. Good grief. The figurehead yeah. hit the ship first and broke on the bottom. And Not an luckily, beginning. the tail yeah. of, of the figurehead was able to hook on uh, so it didn't fall in the sea, we didn't lose it. <laughs> that it's, was the sign, right? It's back up on the bow of the yeah, boat. Yeah, right, right. It's back right. up. Yeah, that's so really good. The, maybe the figurehead saved us. Yeah, right. Say. It's so, so yeah. it's a magnificent. And I'm crawling up on the broken bent bowsprit there, cutting away steel mm -hmm. so that I can use my booms as a crane to lift up the bent steel uh -huh. and pull it back on deck and saw it up and reshape something that I can use to get my two head stay cables that hold the two masts forward uh -huh. back secured to the front of the boat uh -huh. so that I can recut my sails, yes, which are right. now smaller. Yeah, that's right. And, and get you my sails up and be able to sail the boat. You have to do all of that maintenance and work. You have to be very skilled in a lot of different things, welding and cutting and sewing. and everything. It keeps you very busy, uh, one, yeah. uh, one person on a boat Luckily, like that. Luckily, because I built the boat, I was able to succeed because I could repair all the things that broken broke. So many things broke, and it needed so much adjustment. Mm -hmm. This picture is real important because people always ask me, what do I eat? Yeah, sure. And I say, basically, I didn't eat any space food. I didn't eat any processed or no high-tech or high-tech food. No, mm. not at all. Mm. I ate natural, simple food that came in bulk, 50-pound mm -hmm. sacks of rice, 
and beans and oats and uh, boxes of pasta. Mm -hmm. And the key to the diet was sprouts so that I was growing salads every day, eating fresh salads twice a day. I was eating living food yes. grown with love, uh -huh. food that has uh, uh, almost everything in it that you need to live. You but did it, have that wonderful cheese. That and is we so had good. A cheddar cheese that will last for a thousand years. Parmigiano, Reggiano. It's fantastic. We ought to give a plug to them. Well, huh? that, that mm. cheese is aged already for yes. years. <laughs> so I aged it for more years, and I ate the, the best cheese. You gave cheese. some to us on New Year's Eve, and I it ate was really good. I ate the best cheese yeah. right, right, uh, right. And while fish. I was sailing at fish sea. Fish you can take from and the sea. And I caught fish from the sea mm -hmm. and dried the fish so that I was able to eat fish every day. Mm -hmm. And of course, Protein. the rain. Uh, was, rain you catch by rain. I catch sail. the rain. I put out a, a big tarp mm -hmm. and I catch the rain in the tarp. Yeah, that's the thing to do. No desalinization. You had tanks. I had of water, I a desalinator that broke down that I tried to repair and couldn't, couldn't make get work. it working. Right. So you depended upon rain you could catch from the rain. From the rainfall. If you knew you were short of range, ever see the movie Lifeboat? Uh, with you know, uh, where if you're in a lifeboat, if you, if you if you were you could go somewhere where the uh, rain would be falling to catch it. Well, if you knew sort of where you were, and also yeah. you had a stove because sometimes it gets cold, a wood burning stove. You said right. to me, well, if you have, if you need wood, you just go down somewhere out past the Amazon River where they come on the logs come floating by. So right. your fuel would come right floating by, right. and you could go right. to where it was. You mean bring lights up? I have a oh, okay. I want okay. to bring the lights up now. That's a magnificent show, and everything. It's, uh, we got 15 minutes. We got about another six to eight minutes to go. Magnificent show, magnificent story. Yes, Carter, what's going on? Oh no, I'll, I'll just touch. I just had a, a fault. Uh, so the, as we talked, I, I can come back to the uh, journey and, mm -hmm. and the, the shapes, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll just need to um, reboot myself. Okay, okay, yeah. Anyway, it's magnificent, Reed. Magnificent. Congratulations on that, and it's really good to do. And uh, the show that Reed's uh, that uh, Carter's doing is wonderful. Um, you're now um, thinking about letting this be known to more people and so forth, uh, the adventure of it. You're thinking of a book. You're thinking of some multimedia presentation of it. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. we could share a little bit, thinking outward from now uh, about your situation, what mm -hmm. you would like to achieve, and what your ideas are for the future. Well, uh, we want to share the story uh, in any way we can with the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to do uh, talks. Sonia mm -hmm. and I are doing the talking together. Yeah. And uh, so we're working on our books mm -hmm. also because she has a very different story than I have. Yes, indeed. Here's a, a, yeah, a New York City yeah. girl mm -hmm. who was able to give up all of her attachments yeah. and go to sea and sail for 306 days, mm -hmm. the longest sea voyage nonstop for any woman in history, yeah, nonstop a, without that, resupply. Yes, sir. And that's so a world how record. was she able to do that? Uh -huh. And uh, I, I heard her say to someone one time, well, when I went out to sea, it wasn't just for a thousand days. Mm -hmm. I was going out into eternity. Wow. So okay. her state of mind was, uh -huh. okay, well, now here I go. I'm going out mm -hmm. and I'm I'm ready to die. Anything can happen, yeah. and I'm focused here mm -hmm. on this moment, and that it may last forever. Uh -huh. So that made it easier for time to pass. Yes. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. that time we are living our life there, mm -hmm. and we're in a timeless state of mind, and we're adapting and tuning into the environment. Yeah, that's and right. And that's how we naturally live. She had to leave the boat and come back. It must have been very difficult. Her having been your companion for 300 days on the boat, it must have been a very difficult time. I understand she would have had to leave the boat off mm -hmm. uh, Australia, Perth or something. And right. That well, must have been a difficult day for you to say goodbye day. to her. Not the whole, day. The whole thing was the most difficult part of the voyage uh -huh. that saddened me the most. Yeah, I would She think. got very sick when we were uh, between Cape of Good Hope and Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And we were down in the roaring 40s, and we yeah. thought first it's seasickness because it's so rough and stormy. Sure. But she'd already been at sea so long we weren't sure. Then she was so sick she couldn't eat, and then by then I was really worried about her. Yeah. And we talked it over. We weren't sure if she was pregnant. 
Oh, uh -huh. uh, we didn't know for sure, uh -huh. but we w did know that she was very sick, and we were headed to Australia. We were still almost 2,000 miles away. It was the closest <laughs> place. So we emailed the uh, Royal Perth Amazing. Yacht Club yeah. and, and said, yeah. John Sanders is the man who held the longest sea voyage in That's history right. for 30 That's years. Right. That's right. And we said, you got to come out here and pick up Sonia yeah. so that I can keep going. Right. And we sailed near to Perth. We didn't actually see the land. We sailed near an Australian island that was offshore. And they came out in, in a boat. He yeah. came out. Uh -huh. And she was rescued by the man who had the longest sea voyage in history, His the record. Isn't that she, a story? It's a isn't great that, coincidence. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> it's it really should be funny. a movie. I can see. Where's yeah. Mr. Spielberg? Yeah. Yes, it's yes. Uh, yeah. Dr. Mm. Livingston, I yes, presume, yes, kind right, of thing. Right. No, and he took her in, mm. and, uh, and then she was fine when she got on the shore. But when she got home to Queens, New mm. York, yes. uh, uh, and then she went and found out she was pregnant. Okay, you're right. And uh. she had asked me when we were setting off, what if anything happens to me? can I get off the boat? Yeah. And I had always told everyone who, yeah. I said, you can come with me. You have to make me believe that you're going to try yeah. as hard as you can and go the whole way. But if anything happens, I will come near the land and get you rescued off the boat. You, so you that was our plan. You would have set that by your character. You have a very high character and sense of empathetic understanding of the people with whom you interrelate. You're a gentleman, sir. You are a true well, gentleman. You know, a lot of people were very angry at me that uh -huh. I didn't stop the boat and get off with her uh -huh. and that I didn't stop the boat when she found out she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. A lot of people made a public to do about that and well, didn't like me. But you see, a lot of schmucks in we the had to go, I had to go on. Mm -hmm. I had to I succeed at my mission. And Sonia understood that totally Absolutely. and completely yeah. and was totally supportive of yeah. me. Uh -huh. There was a thousand people who helped me get out there. Yes. And, and I had to succeed. Together, Sonia and I succeeded because I went on. Yeah, and and then of course you have a wonderful b uh, d dividend in Dawson. <laughs> so she was there with our son, who yes, was to almost two you. years Tell old, me. to greet what me on the story. dock when we got there. What a there. beautiful story! I never saw another human being for over two years. Two years during yeah. that right. time. Right during that time, what a feat! And we what still will apply that to uh -huh. Mars psychology because yeah. when I tried to do this voyage, I mm -hmm. thought I was going to go with three couples or six people. Mm -hmm then it would be really like a crew of people going to Mars. Mm -hmm. But I never could find the people that wanted to go. All right. And I made advertisements. I got lots of press. I never found the people that were willing to commit to that. You found one. So I found one. And that's And we good. did the voyage. Right. And when she had, to, she could have completed the voyage. It's too bad yeah. that she didn't. Yeah. But yeah. we're happy that things worked out good. Absolutely incredible. But Absolutely it's, incredible story. There's something to be said about the psychology of one person, because it's possible one person could make a trip to Mars. Mm -hmm. And it would be much cheaper and much easier mm -hmm. and, and have a lot of, uh, of things that would keep it so that great, we could still accomplish a human into outer space for an extended period of time. Absolutely important. We were able to do that. We've run right out of time, sorry to say. It's really been an interesting, interesting, interesting program. I only wish you both the very, very best in your collectively up till now so well-led lives of contribution to improving the human condition. You're both major citizens of Spaceship Earth, and I thank you really very much for coming in. We and the world only wishes both of you all the very best as you plow ahead through the ocean.